Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about gardening, botanical history, and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and today is October 1st. Welcome, October. Today in botanical history, we celebrate an American botanist, professor, and writer. We also celebrate an American short story writer and her last novel. And we also recognize an amateur botanist who was honored with the Australian Native Plants Award. We'll hear an excerpt from Neil Gaiman's book, Season of Myths. And we grow that garden library today with a master book on wreaths. Just fantastic. And then we'll wrap things up with a garden classic that came out on this day back in 2013. It's one of my favorite books. And I know I say that all the time, but I do have a number of favorites. So there you go. Is there a limit? I don't think so. Not if you love garden books. I hope you're nodding your head. All right, it's time for today's curated news. Well, today's curated news is from The Guardian. It was written by James Wong, one of my favorite rock star gardeners that I love to follow. And I especially enjoy his Twitter feed. In any case, this is an article that he wrote and it's called How Your Electric Toothbrush Can Aid Pollination. No joke. And actually, if you think about it, it makes complete sense. James writes, many plants in the nightshade family, from tomatoes and chilies to peppers and eggplants, rely on what is known as buzz pollination. This is the process by which the rapid ultrasonic vibrations emitted by species like bumblebees and apparently like electric toothbrushes release pollen grains, which are otherwise tightly held in the anthers of flowers. Now, of course, if you're in an area where there just are not enough pollinators around, then you need to hand pollinate. Now, James points out that traditionally, horticulturists have used a tuning fork because that mimics the high-frequency vibrations of the bees, and that tricks the plant into releasing its pollen. But apparently, an electric toothbrush really does the trick. James writes that the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, decided to run a beautifully simple experiment comparing the efficacy of using an electric toothbrush with that of a tuning fork. And they found that removing the brush head and touching that little metal nub to the center of an open flower and then letting it vibrate against the bloom for about five seconds well, that was enough time to trick the plant into self-pollinating. And now the light bulbs are going off because obviously the key to this is removing the brush head. So don't forget to do that. Now, as for James, he tried this in his backyard and he found as much as a 20% boost in his yields. And he said it took him less than 10 minutes to do. Pretty cool. All right, now if you would like to track down this article about how an electric toothbrush can aid pollination, all you need to do is head on over to the Daily Gardener community over in Facebook. It's the group that I created for listeners of the show. Type in the word toothbrush and James's post will pop right up and you can read all about this for yourself. Make a little printout, send it around, whatever you want to do with it. I think this is a great article. If you're not in the Facebook group for the show, there you always have a standing invitation you know you can join at any time. You can also invite your garden friends. So if you're in the group, don't forget that you have the ability to invite other gardeners that you know, like, and trust into the group. That's totally fine. You can do that. And to join the group, it's very easy. All you do is head on up to the search bar where you're going to type in your friend's name and instead type in the words Daily Gardener Community, then answer three little questions about the podcast, and then I will admit you into the group. And I am the person that reads all of those applications into the group. I want to make sure that we keep spammers out and gardeners in. So there you go. Make sure you answer those questions. I'll let you into the group. All right, it's time for today's botanical history. Here's botanical history for today, October 1st. Today is the birthday of Leroy Abrams. 
He was born on this day, October 1st in 1874. He was an American botanist, professor, and writer. And he was born in the little town of Sheffield, Iowa, before he moved west with his parents as a small boy. As a graduate student, he botanized around Los Angeles, not exactly an area that you would think of for botanizing, but that's exactly what he did. And a biographical sketch of Leroy said that he crisscrossed Southern California in a wagon, on the back of a mule or burrow, and on foot to make field observations and collected specimens from St. Barbara to Yuma, from Needles to San Diego, and from the Salton Sink prior to its flooding to the summits of Old Baldy. Now in 1904, Leroy published a flora. It was of Los Angeles and vicinity. And I love that vicinity to Leroy meant a radius of 50 miles. Think about that. Well, five years later, in 1909, Leroy married a fellow student at Stanford named Letitia Patterson. The couple hand-built and enjoyed a mountain cabin on the west side of Fallen Leaf Lake. And when their only daughter died a few short years after her college graduation, they shouldered their grief together. And I bet they spent many days at Fallen Leaf Lake. Leroy served as the director of the Natural History Museum at Stanford. And that's where he taught botany for 34 years. The final volume of his four-volume work that was called An Illustrated Flora of the Pacific States was completed posthumously. Leroy was a loving teacher. I found out that his students called him father. And here's another little tidbit I discovered about Leroy. When at 51 years old, the great botanist Inez Mejia decided to pursue a career in botany, her very first official course was on flowering plants. And her very first teacher was, you guessed it, Leroy Abrams. And it was on this day in 1972 that the Tampa Tribune profiled the American short story writer Eudora Welty, and they shared some backstory on what would be her last book. Here's what the article said. Miss Welty was writing her book, Losing Battles, at home with her dying mother, two nurses, and laughing a great deal. The book is beyond grief and funny as owls in heaven. That's what it says here. And the nurses did not approve of anything. And right in the middle of it, the nematodes did in the roses, which had been packed in that garden tight as a trunk, but nothing that could be tried availed at all. Now, ordinarily, an attack on her roses would have brought Mrs. Welty right out of the kitchen, as they say, but she was past those battles then. Her characters and her stories are like the roses. Some make it, some don't. And today in 2019, the amateur botanist Glenn Leiper, I hope I'm saying that right, received the Australian Native Plants Award. He co-wrote a popular field guide to native plants in southeast Queensland called Mangroves to Mountains. Great title. And while botanizing the area, he rediscovered the rainforest myrtle tree, Gossia gonocleta, a century after the plant was considered extinct. He also discovered a native violet colony. And one time, he spotted a 15-centimeter tall plant from his car while driving. And that unusual spotting resulted in the naming of the plant in his honor. They named it Androcalva liperi. Now, Glenn acknowledges that he has a most helpful skill for botany. He told an interviewer in an article, I've got good eyes. 
It's time for today's Unearthed Words. Today's Unearthed Words come to us from Neil Gaiman. This is from his book, Season of Miss. October knew, of course, that the action of turning a page, of ending a chapter, or of shutting a book did not end a tale. Having admitted that, he would also avow that happy endings were never difficult to find. It is simply a matter, he explained to April, of finding a sunny place in a garden where the light is golden and the grass is soft. Somewhere to rest, to stop reading, and to be content. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Wreaths, by Terry Chandler. This book came out in 2018, and the subtitle is Fresh, Foraged, and Dried Floral Arrangements. Well, in this book, Terry shares her nature-inspired wreaths. Now, if you've ever tried to make your own wreath, you know it's more complicated than it looks. Terry breaks down the fine art of creative wreath making, playing with color, texture, natural elements, by the way, her foraging is spot on, and how to use them. If you thought wreaths were just for the front door, Terry will dispel that and show you how to integrate them into your home to dress up unexpected areas like chairs, centerpieces, and even a stack of books. This book is 144 pages of wreath goodness, good ideas, good uses, and excellent form. You can get a copy of Wreaths by Terry Chandler and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $3. Now that's a steal. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. It was on this day, back in 2013, that the book Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kammerer was released. The compelling subtitle to this book is Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. Now, the book has brought Robin fame and has opened the eyes of her readers who see the natural world in a new way which is actually an ancient way. Robin introduces her book on her website with this excerpt. I could hand you a braid of sweet grass, as thick and shining as the plate that hung down my grandmother's back, but it is not mine to give, nor yours to take. So I offer in its place a braid of stories meant to heal our relationship with the world. Well, as you can tell, Robin's prose is like poetry, and her Native American roots offer a distinct and more profound way to connect with plants and with the world. As a botanist and a professor of plant ecology, Robin approaches nature with a spirit of gratitude and humility. And in her book, Robin writes of gardens and gardening. Well, how would you know it's love and not just good soil, she asks. Where's the evidence? What are the key elements for detecting loving behavior? No one would doubt that I love my children. And even a quantitative social psychologist would find no fault with my list of loving behaviors, nurturing health and well-being, protection from harm, encouraging individual growth and development, desire to be together, generous sharing of resources, working together for a common goal, celebration of shared values, interdependence, sacrifice by one for the other, 
creation of beauty. Why then, seeing this list, would you not make the leap to say that the garden loves her back? That's a good question. And as Robin knows, it's a question that most of us would not even consider asking. Yet as gardeners, the idea of finding love in our gardens may not be such a strange notion after all. Do we not find renewal and healing from the solitude offered in our gardens? Are there not moments where we find a deeper understanding of ourselves or a new wonderment about the world just from being in our gardens? And isn't renewal, healing, self-discovery, and wonder the benefits we receive from being loved. It's something nice to consider, isn't it? It's something that Robin has thought about. In Braiding Sweetgrass, she writes, This is really why I made my daughters learn to garden, so they would always have a mother to love them, long after I am gone. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Maple Grove in Wyoming, Minnesota. If you want to read today's show notes, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. And don't forget that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can always get in touch by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you on Monday.